Welcome back from your break. Please open in your Bibles your, or your Bible applications to Luke's Gospel, the third book of the New Testament, Luke chapter 2, in a message I've entitled, The Day After Christmas, because it is the day after Christmas, I thought we would look at Luke's, what scholars call, infancy narrative about what took place in the days after Christmas involving our Lord Jesus Christ, when he's no longer a baby, but actually is now an infant, and the events surrounding that. But I want to begin, before we read the scripture, with a humorous illustration, if you'll allow that, before we read God's holy word. And it really encapsulates the theme and the application of the, um, uh, of the message. Um, today, in countries that were once associated with the Commonwealth of Great Britain, when England was a royal kingdom, uh, and she had colonies, which she does not, although some of her former colonies still uh, call themselves Commonwealth states. Uh, if you travel to Europe uh, and visit places like, say, Scotland, you'll, you'll hear that word Commonwealth associated with, say, the Commonwealth Games, which is their version, I guess, of the British Olympics. Anyway, today is called Boxing Day. The day after Christmas is called Boxing Day. Say boxing. It is what it sounds like, right? Boxing, and it has nothing to do with boxing up those Christmas gifts that don't fit or were the wrong, you know, wrong gift to begin with and sending them back to Amazon or Target or wherever you ordered your gifts. It actually has somewhat of a, I think of, maybe a Christian-influenced tradition, is back in the earlier eons of Great Britain's history, on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, the servants of the manor, those men and women who worked on these large landed estates. Um, if you're familiar with British history, you know about how the manor um, occupied a large area of acreage where the, the owner of the manor lived with his family. The servants would come and with open boxes, right, receive from the, the owner uh, gifts or, as we talked about before the service, perhaps leftovers from the feast uh, the day before. But they would receive, and it was often in generous allotments from the owner, expression of his generosity, food or gifts, and they would take them back to their homes and celebrate the day after Christmas. That tradition continues in Great Britain, although I don't think people are going to their next door neighbors and saying, hey, do you have any leftover Christmas cookies or eggnog or wassail that I could take home to my... Uh... But uh, they celebrate today as a day of giving um, gifts to the poor. Uh, it's sort of an expression, if you will, of uh, their, uh, if you can call it this, their Christian heritage. Well, we are here in the pages of Scripture where God gives an unexpected gift to two very poor people. They're not expecting it, although they're looking for it, faithful Jews as they are, and they are very grateful for it, what they receive. But it's really only a partial blessing because the gift that they receive awaits its fullest gift not only in the maturity of Christ and the death of Christ and his resurrection, but when Christ comes again and inaugurates his, consummates his kingdom. We're talking, of course, about Simeon and Anna in the temple days after the birth of Christ when they get to hold the baby Christ child. And so the application's simple. They were needy Jews waiting on their promised Messiah. And so hope finds its beginning in need. But they were looking. They were looking for the promised hope. 
And so God empowers us to look through the promises he makes to us about Christ. And then having partially received, partially received, right? They're holding a baby. They're still going back to lives of difficulty, adversity, poverty, even oppression by Rome. They proclaim to others the good news as they await its consummation. This is God's word. Luke chapter 2. I hope I have my glasses, which of course I do not. Somewhere. Thank you. Beginning in verse 22. Actually, no, let's, let's pick up in verse 17. And when they had known, saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Verse 21. And at the end of eight days... When Jesus was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Luke is quoting Leviticus and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of the peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother, speaking of Joseph and Mary, marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul, pierce, excuse me, through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. Lord, the day after Christmas, we thank you for all that has taken place already as an expression of your kindness to us that we can gather and singing songs and listening and considering the words of those songs. Lord, have our hearts encouraged in the hope that is found in Christ. Having scriptures read to us, having prayers being prayed for us and by us for others. Lord, we pray on this day after Christmas, would you bless us, would you reward us with a surprising 
insight, with a glimpse into your activity, with a renewed hope in the midst of our uncertainties, and Lord, with the joy while we wait for Christ's return of knowing he is with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's been said by others that we live for what we hope for. We live for what we hope for, and in so living, we prepare a way for the Lord. Well, in the pages of Luke, in the days after Christmas, we are introduced to two people, one Simeon and then Anna, who were living for what they hoped for. They were living out of their messianic hope, the hope that God would indeed send his promised king, the Messiah, even as they prepared their hearts for the coming of the Lord. Before I share with you my main point, it's helpful to just consider briefly and really amazingly the context of this passage because it's familiar to many of us. And I think if you're like me, we really aren't astonished enough to grasp what Luke is recording for us. It has been 400 years since the Lord has spoken a word through one of his prophets to his people. Consider that. God has been silent for 400 years. I lose my mind when a week of devotions goes by and I feel like I'm not getting anything from the Bible. 400 years of silence. Now, I know for parents of young children, silence is a blessing. And you're probably thinking, that probably isn't such a bad thing, is it? <laughs> I get it. I am parents of older children, and silence can be a blessing, too. But I love my kids. I do. I'm sure my silence in their lives is a blessing as well. But when you're the people of God, let's be clear, and God has been silent for that long, you can't help but conclude he doesn't care about us anymore. We really botched it up, didn't we? We've broken covenant with him again and again. And we've been unfaithful to his promises. Our past haunts us like a nightmare that won't let go. And our present circumstances, really, oppressed by Rome, governed by the autocratic power that she was and all of her anti-Semitism. God's silence for the people of God. I suggest to you it caused many of them to stop waiting. Someone shared with me the content of a sermon that was given last night by a pastor in the Philadelphia area. I'm from Philadelphia. And he did his message on the Magi. And in doing his message on the Magi, which sounds like it was an outstanding message, he pointed out, based on his study and scholarship, that whereas we're not told how many magi there were, right? We're only told of the gifts they gave, three gifts. But we're also perhaps not aware of the astonishment the magi felt when they arrived in the city of kings and discovered that no one, no one, seemed to be waiting for the fulfillment of Micah's promise. It's as if the people of God, as led by the scribes and teachers of the law, and even King Herod himself, the king of the Jews, had given up hope. 
that's the context when we read about Simeon, filled as he is with the Spirit, and Anna, faithful in the temple, waiting for the Lord to keep his promises. It's astonishing. It's really, in some ways, miraculous, humanly speaking, and it's intended to arrest my attention that God is teaching his people something about hope when it comes to Christ and the fulfillment of his promises that if we allow it, will not only allow it to take deeper root in the midst of our uncertainty and needs, but will lead us to look for Christ through the promises he makes and then bring us to a place of worship and gratefulness for how he has partially kept his promises so far while we await his blessed return. And that's my main point this morning. Hope in Jesus leads us to wait, look for, and worship Christ. Let's look at the opening verses together, verses 22 through 30 again, and consider my first, if you will, header. Hope begins with a spirit of need. And as we consider this, consider this day after Christmas, what and in whom are you hoping for? Are you waiting for as you look to 2022? It tells us that following Jesus's circumcision, verse 21, after eight days, where Jesus is given the name that the angel revealed to both Mary and also to Joseph, that he would be called Jesus. And he was circumcised in fulfillment of the law, the Mosaic law, and thus was now a part of the covenant, the Old Testament people, your covenant identity and membership was sealed, if you will, if you were a male by this right. It says that they came to the temple, to Jerusalem, when their time of purification, according to the law of Moses, had concluded. Scholars suggest it's about 30 days after the fact. So Jesus is most likely 40 days old, and Mary and Joseph come to the temple to offer, it says in verse 23, a sacrifice according to the law of the Lord, according to the laws found in Leviticus, found in our Old Testament, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So right from the jump, we're introduced to two people who are making an offering that signifies their status in their society. They are poor. They are peasants. They can't afford a lamb, which is the other acceptable sacrifice for purification. So they offer these two turtle doves to make atonement for Mary bringing Jesus into the world. Leviticus 12 eight. you can look it up later. To make herself clean ritualistically clean, and therefore offer worship to Yahweh. I can't help but pause and think about the wretched circumstances of these two. Mary describes her estate as humble in Luke 1, 48, after the angel's announcement that she will give birth miraculously to Christ. But not only in their poverty, but their experience of the last 40 days, being hurried to Bethlehem to participate in a census imposed by them by a Roman autocrat and dictator giving birth in a stable, because there's no room in the inn, having a, a cattle trough for the bedding of their baby, and now 
having to travel the eight or so miles to, to Jerusalem, again, unable to afford a more significant sacrifice than two turtle doves. And yet we see in the midst of their uncertainty and inconveniences and difficulties and trials, hope taking root in the hearts of these two parents. And I think that's the first point which Simeon makes it as well, is that it does seem that in Christianity that, that hope takes root and finds its home when we are most more aware of our need, when we lack what we feel we need, when we have a, a sense of our inadequacy and, and circumstances squeeze us and push us where perhaps we don't know what to do or what we're doing feels so futile. Mary and Joseph, although faithful to the law, I wonder if circumstantially, even emotionally, they struggle with their hope. I would. And it's to them, the hopeless or those struggling with hope, that one Simeon is brought to. And that brings me to my second point. Second point of looking. We go from waiting, hope, beginning, and taking root in a spirit of need to looking. God's promises lead us to look to Christ. There was a man, it says, verse 25, named Simeon. He was righteous. He was devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the Spirit, when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God, saying, and then this beautiful, prophetic, declaration regarding the identity of the Christ child. Simeon was looking for Christ, fueled as he was by the promises he knew. Now, I know a lot of God's promises. If you were to give me a quiz on them, I could probably tell you where they're found in the Bible, and you could too, I think. But knowing what the promises are in Scripture does not always lead me to look to God to keep them, even partially in my life. It takes a gracious endowment by God to look, doesn't it? And we have that. Through the work of the Spirit who indwells us, we have that. Through the encouragement of the Scripture, we have that. Through others, as they share with us how they're looking and talking about Christ. Let's see how keen our powers of observation are this morning and then apply it to our day-to-day walks with Christ. I'm sure many of you have noticed that Dan is playing a new instrument. How many of you have noticed that? Just raise your hands. Yeah worship team has and the sound team has and some of you have I love that thing and I love how he plays that thing and I've said to him now at least three times I really like your new guitar and he says to me Jim smiling it's not a guitar it's not a guitar well it's definitely not a piano what is it it's a, now correct me, Dan, because it's a small group. Did you call it a mellow cello? Mando cello. Mello cello, mando cello. Big difference. It sounds beautiful. 
and it looks amazing to me, and he plays it well. A mando cello. I've noticed that because I'm looking while we're singing these songs. Recently, one of my family members, who I won't name, said that in his workplace, his coworkers have noticed and complimented him or her, ready for this, on their socks. The socks that they wear. I'm not making this up. I know you think I make these stories up. And sincerely, they have complimented him or her that he wears nice socks. I noticed today on the worship team that somebody else wears nice socks to church. Now, it's not Dan. He's got keen on and, you know, keen footwear and just, you know, dark socks. And it's not me. Mine are just boring old. But I'll give you her initials. (laughs) And then after the service, just have her pull her pants up just like a quarter of an inch and show you these eye-popping socks. Ready? L E. <laughs> That's all they're going to think about the rest of the sermon, honey. Like, but they're beautiful. I see them now. But you got to be, you got to be looking. I mean, I know, I know she wears socks, but you got to be looking to see them. When I am faced with unexpected circumstances that introduce levels of uncertainty to the functional hopes that help me do day-to-day living. When, When more than one set of circumstances comes into my life, or those I love, and my, my life just feels like it's starting to lose order and control and I'm being turned upside down and, and for no, no fault of my own. And it's just uncertainty and what that brings, the, perhaps the fear or, or doubts or frustrations and anger that these things seem to raise in my heart. I may know the promises of God, but it's hard for me to look at them in a way that I am looking for God's activity in my life. See, Simeon's not on vacation when he's at the temple. He's in the spirit, but he's a fellow Jew like every other Jew that hasn't heard from God speak. He's aware there's this promise, but there's no prophet. And he is oppressed as they wait for the messianic hope. And yet, By God's grace, it says, verse 27, when the parents brought in the child Jesus, he took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. It's a baby. It's a baby. There are no neon signs in the temple saying, this is him. There's no soundtrack playing in the temple. Uh, It's a baby. And yet, because by God's mercy in his life, his hope, focused as it is by the promises of Christ, has been activated. And the spirit in the mystery of this moment is working in him. As he looks at the baby, he realizes... In this moment, I'm holding the Messiah and blesses him and blesses his parents. And application, well, I need God's help on the day after Christmas and in the days ahead to recognize the activity of God in my life even in the midst of uncertainty. And he will use the promises of God to focus my hope on Christ and not merely my circumstances, but nevertheless, I need him to give me those powers of observation 
to discern where God is being faithful and God is at work and God is still fulfilling his purposes, even in the midst of uncertainty, so that I can live for what I hope for. We do not worship a living God who is on holiday the day after Christmas. Amen? We worship a living God who is very much involved with each of our lives, even in our uncertainties, as we live for what we hope for. So a couple suggestions to help stoke your hope engine, even as we turn to conclude the message. If you're struggling, as I often do in the day after Christmas, to focus on Christ, read a gospel. Put down your reading plan. Open up the gospel and start reading again the story of Jesus. I just finished Luke. I'm going to be reading Mark. I know what it says, but I'm asking God as I read the gospel to give me that childlike sense of wonder again. Wonder that's lived out and focusing me in such a way that I can see what Christ did then, he is continuing to do now in my life through his people for the glory of his kingdom. Join a small group of people who are looking with you. Or renew your participation in a small group of people who are looking for God's activity I'm all for sharing our burdens, encouraging one another, and praying. But I also think we can encourage one another. This is where we see God's faithfulness. This is where we see God working. This is where I see, it may not be in this area where I need him to, but I certainly see it here, and that gives me hope to pray more here. Yes, share our needs. Praise God. It expresses humility, but let's share our hope as we discern Serve somebody who's more needy than you outside of your immediate family and be a means of God's mercy and hope. I need this more than it. Writing Christmas cards this year and thanking people, it's just a habit I've gotten out of. And as I wrote Christmas cards this year and thanked people for the way I've seen God at work in their lives or serving people, I just got joyful. I don't know why. I just got my eyes off of myself, and I, I, but I think I trust I was serving them by thanking God for them and drawing attention to ways their every week faithfulness is a blessing to others. This culture stinks at giving thanks about anything. We're so saturated with entitlements and, and a sense of, I deserve this, but when I take time to serve another and meeting their need and perhaps doing that in ways that fit my personality as ordinary as writing a thank you note or or expressing care in some way. My hope in Christ reignites. It's very practical. Last one. Since I can't read my writing, I don't have a last one. All I know is that when we're looking for God to fulfill his promises in our lives, it leads us to do things. Reading a gospel, joining a small group to share the hope of Christ, listening, serving others. That then brings us to our final point where we not only see how hope takes root and begins in a spirit of need and God's promises lead us to to look to Christ and to look for Christ, but it it deepens our worship. Hope about what we have already received overflows in praise to Christ. Hope about what we have already received overflows in thankfulness about Christ. There was a prophetess, it says, verse 36, named Anna. She was advanced in years. She was a widow, verse 37. She did not depart from the temple. 
she worshiped with fasting and prayer night and day. And she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. I'm assuming, although it doesn't say explicitly in the text, that Anna was a witness to what Simeon had just declared. But either way, she was aware God was keeping his promises. The Messiah was born. The hope that had taken root in her heart, even as a widow, was coming to fruition. And she, it says, gave thanks to God and spoke of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Christ. There's the application in the text, those three words. She spoke of him. She spoke of him. She spoke of Jesus. So applying that as we conclude, I have two alternatives. I can choose not to speak of Jesus, perhaps live out the Christian life, but not to speak about Jesus, to do good things and be good to my neighbor or love my family. Or, but sometimes I need to just speak of Jesus in order to know the hope to which he is. Or I can choose not to speak of him, but I can speak of him in a way that leaves my self-sufficiencies a little too intact. Where rather than speaking of him, I'm really, for whatever reason, in a backhanded way, speaking of the ways in which he has helped me depend on me or my self-sufficiencies and not realize that the gospel, when we have this quote, helps me and teaches me to speak of him and him alone. For the message of the gospel reminds us that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe but we are more loved and accepted by Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. That's Tim Keller. In other words, the simple message that Christ died in my place for the forgiveness of our sins and your sins in order that I might receive him and receiving him, receive not only forgiveness of my sin, but eternal life in him. That's good news. It reminds me, even as a Christian today, when I rehearse the gospel, I'm more sinful and flawed than I ever dared believe. God loves me. And I'm more loved and accepted by Christ than we ever dared hope. And so Jesus is more capable, more willing to deepen my hope in him as we call on his name and thank him for the blessings he has given. Last point, and I conclude. Anna's thanking God, as is Simeon, in their prophetic roles for redemption that is yet to be realized. They're seeing a, an infant no mention here of the cross yet. Just a promise. And then when the cross of Christ comes, some 30 years later, the disciples then who followed him, they awaited a resurrection, a glorious resurrection that no one expected. But during that 40 days after his resurrection, they said to him, is it now that your kingdom's coming? And... He said, no. As he was taken up in Acts 1 and seated at the right hand of majesty and now rules, the angels told him, he will one day return and consummate his kingdom. But now, now you've got work to do. And part of that work includes our hope in Jesus as we wait and look for and worship him. So as we conclude, it's, it's my prayer for you, and it's my prayer for myself as well, that as we taste of the hope of Christ, that it enables us to wait for the day when we see him face to face. 
And as we see the hope of Christ take root in the lives of those around us, that it inspires us to worship Christ with even more rigor and passion. And as we experience hope through God's activity in our lives in a personal way, we pray for those around us and we find ways to share in appropriate ways the same hope we have been given. Friend, what do you need to receive hope like that the day after Christmas? We need Jesus, and he's present to lead us to put our hope in him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for my friends on this, the day after Christmas. And I pray, Lord, in, in some small way, You would take each of us by the hand and lead us in our hearts to wait, look, and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for the ways in which you have been and will continue to be faithful in our lives. And we pray, Lord, for even an increased ability and gratitude to overflow from our lives because of Christ. But Lord, we also pray, help us. Help us as we face uncertainties. Help us as, Lord, we, we feel um, the, the ground beneath us shift as things we, we look to or depend on, Lord, seem like they're, they're giving way. Lord, help us in those moments, Lord, to remember Christ, to focus our hope on Christ through the promises that he has given us, and even to praise Christ in that moment, in the midst of our uncertainty for the faithfulness he has shown, beginning with our salvation, but also, Lord, the blessings he has given that will strengthen our hope as we continue forward. Lead us on, Lord Jesus, as we look to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.